Welcome to Pivot Points, a new series featuring some of the world's most successful women, candidly sharing their stories and insights about how they made it to the top and how you can too. Hosted by Perry Yateman, a straight-talking global executive and award-winning author who created the career and life of her dreams and now wants to help other ambitious women do the same. Welcome, I'm Perry Yateman, host of Pivot Points, and I can't wait to introduce you to my next guest. When I first met her, it was at a Girl Scout National Board meeting more than a decade ago. We were both new to the board, and as I recall, I think we're the only two representatives from Chicago. I was a relatively recent Chicago transplant, but I quickly learned that she was a Chicago institution. Over many car rides shared to and from the airport, I learned a lot about her. Of course, she's smart and she's capable and she's confident. You know, frankly, you can't climb as high as she had without those attributes. But what struck me more was her incredible strength in the face of adversity, both professional and personal, her deep and passionate commitment to women and girls, and her incredible ability to just get things done. It is no wonder after just one term on the board, she was elected president the highest ranking volunteer position for this nearly three million strong organization. She has never failed to inspire me and I'm sure she'll do the same for you. So without further delay, I would like to introduce you to Connie Lindsay. She is executive vice president and global head of CSR and diversity for Northern Trust, a financial services company with nearly one trillion, that's with a T, dollars in assets under management. Connie, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Perry. It's good to hear your voice and to be with you. You know, we've talked, you know, everybody now knows where you are, but everybody's journey had to start somewhere. Can you tell us a little bit about what was the first job that really launched you and what was it about that job that made it so important and how did you get it? The first job that launched me was becoming the head of sales for treasury management marketing at Northern Trust, the firm that I work for now. I joined Northern from Ameritech Corporation um, and really was thinking about what my career would look like. I wasn't chasing a position or a title, but how could I grow more as a leader and a person that would add additional value to the business? And my mentor at that time said to me, in order to really move forward, you're going to need to manage a sales team. Mm -hmm. Well, there were three things that I was certain of in life. One was that I didn't want to be a salesperson because I had come from a finance background. <laughs> Two was I didn't want to be a salesperson because I had come from a finance background. And three was I didn't want to be a salesperson. <laughs> Needless to say, through his coaching and encouragement and quite frankly saying, in order to get your ticket punched in this organization, it's important that you have great alacrity and skill with clients. But the most important thing that he said to me, Perry, was, and I believe you can do it. Mm. I believe you can do it. Now, I was coming into a sales, to manage a sales team. I'd not been a salesperson. I had done product management work and certainly had done the kinds of things on the non-client facing side of the work. But the words, I believe you can do it, not only did he say, I can believe you can do it, but he really provided the kind of air cover that when I needed advice and counsel, I could go to him without fear of judgment or retribution or something that would make me believe that I was lacking. Now, the 15 people reporting to me didn't have a lot of confidence because they felt here we're getting a person who really is more of a numbers person. She's not the sales product kind of individual. So it was proving to them that I could lead, articulate a vision, have the kind of financial acumen that would allow us to grow the business, and quite frankly, with good listening skills and, and good ability to ask questions, to learn the business, but also provide value for them. And so I tried to find out what was the biggest challenge that that group had at that time. And the biggest challenge that they articulated was that they didn't have enough computers. So I negotiated with the president of the business unit to get those computers and laptops so that as they traveled, they had access to technology. And then it was on from there. We, we exceeded our sales goal. I became ever more comfortable in the work that I did and actually was then promoted from that role to senior vice president. And from then on, you didn't just say the three things I know are I'm not going to be in sales. <laughs> and from then on, it became selling is critically important. It challenges us in ways that and, and caused me to go deep inside of my reservoir of skills and, and techniques. It honed my listening skills to a point where I'm able to discern what a cause and effect can be, what questions people are, are considering and listening more than we speak so that I'm able then to 
be present with people and they know and sense that presence and it creates a level of authenticity and comfort on the part of the other individual and that really has been the greatest benefit from that experience. Very important. And what's interesting is what I love about that story is also that what was the right thing for you was not what you initially thought was the right thing for you because so often what I'm hearing as I interview uh, equally successful women it is Gosh, I thought I should have gone X, but I was, for one reason or another, or maybe I just got lucky, I did Y, and Y was actually, it made all the difference. It was the right choice. So, you know, sometimes you don't know what the right choice is, and sometimes you do have to kind of take a leap of faith that somebody who's telling you, go go do sales, is right. So, well done. Which is why having that sponsor, coach, and mentor relationship in an organization is so important, because it isn't one of those things where you I would have shown up on any rating and the talent development discussions mm -hmm. to say she should go into that role. Here are her skills, and we, we like to put people in places where we think their skills would take them. This was totally off the radar, but it was having that individual saying, you should do this. Here's what I think would be good for you. Let me ask, I want to follow up on that because I think it is such an important point. Um, how do you think you won? It was a him, right? How did you win him mm -hmm. over, and how did you make him such an advocate for you? That is such a good question. I often have people who will say, how do you get a sponsor? Do you ask people? Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this, Perry, that there are three things I think that all of us need in our careers. I don't believe that any of us are self-made. I am a part of every individual who's written something on the tablet of my heart. Coaches talk at you, mentors talk to you, and sponsors talk about you. I became known for taking on difficult challenges, certainly having an intellectual approach, but also an ability to connect with other people. That leader who could articulate a vision and help people say and have the confidence that we would be able to get to that next place. So it was the hard work, but it was also ensuring that whenever I had the opportunity to talk about the work that my team and I were doing, that I was willing to be able to say, here is what I created on behalf of our company or our team, and here, here's how it's going to benefit. And when I joined the firm, this was an individual who was willing to be a sponsor, to be a coach and a mentor. And, you know, luck of the draw. I can't say that there was anything magical. Certainly, I was competent. I was capable. I was ready to do the work and was indefatigable in my pursuit of excellence on behalf of the company and myself and my team. But that was the, the most important thing because in the normal course of human events, the way my career moved at that moment would not have happened. And I have to add, as a woman of color, 23 years ago, I certainly would not have been discussed in the way that would have necessarily allowed me to be a part of any discussion to move that quickly in my career. Yep. In fact, I'd like to pick up on that because fair or not, women, and as you say, women of color even more so, are much more harshly scrutinized um, on the way up and all the way through, actually, than their male peers. And, it's, and when I say harshly scrutinized, it's either that you actually are harshly scrutinized or that you actually don't get considered either way, right? I mean, it can happen mm -hmm. on either side. And it's not just on performance where I think it's quite fair. It's actually on everything from looks to parenting to whatever. Did you face that scrutiny? Um, and if you did, uh, how, how did you handle it? What's fascinating now at this point in my career, where I'm, I'm leading our global diversity and inclusion practice at our firm. I chose this role and this work now in my career because to have done it at any time prior to that, it would have been moving into a role that wasn't quite highly regarded as having P&L experience, as mm -hmm. I've had in three of our, our key businesses. And I would say to you, even to this day, after all these many years, microaggression and marginality, I still experience that in my career, that somehow, some way, my accomplishments are not the same as that of a non-person of color. Uh, the recent McKinsey and Company work on women in the workplace specifically says, that you know, women of color, we are the most underrepresented group in the corporate pipeline. Mm -hmm. We actually want to be moved forward and advanced more than our white sisters do. But we're yet 9% less likely to having received a challenging assignment or an assignment that allows us to have a P&L. And I jokingly said to someone this morning as I was delivering a keynote, we've leaned in so much, Perry, that we're falling over. <laughs> so, so, so those rules really are quite different for women of color. And yes, I've experienced and still do microaggression, marginality. I'm continually perhaps asked or questioned about the veracity of an argument that I might make or the work that I might do. So it isn't gone or done. What have I done about it? I have an amazing support system. I have proven myself through performance 
but I'm also personally courageous. I have to be willing to say, what am I going to risk to maintain the kind of authenticity that I need to be comfortable in my own skin? How am I going to approach when people are off-putting or uncomfortable because I am in the role that I'm in? But it's also important for me to create that ontological space where I am approachable, where I'm not leading with that issue or that diversity because I can't hide behind it, but I'm also not afraid to say, I am a woman of color, but I belong here. And I have to say, uh, having known you and having watched you do it in organizations outside of Northern Trust, I think you do it brilliantly. So thank you for that. And thank you for being a role model for for all of us. Um, Thank you. I want to talk about um, something related to what normally happens in kind of mid-career, but can also happen later in the career, which is that it's all about negotiation, right? And so when you want a transition, whether it's a personal transition or a professional transition, whether you are going for a second act or whether you are um, you know, trying to move up in your current company, you have to be able to be clear about what you want and you have to be able to negotiate effectively to get it. How have you approached that and what are your best tips for women? Because we keep hearing women are not good at negotiating and yet all of us had to do it to get where we got. So what would be your tips for why do you think you're successful at negotiating? I'll go. One is I've certainly taken whatever opportunity I have to learn specifically about the psychological implications of negotiation, reading about it, uh, working with people who know and, and being trained in it. But that sales experience that I talked to mm-hmm. earlier, yep. it helped me to understand the first no. It helped me to understand that it is very important how to respond when we get pushback. How when I ask for something or I lay out the case for something and the the first answer is no or or the person or individuals with whom I'm speaking don't believe that it should happen in that way, to pivot, to be able to say, help me understand or to present additional information. The most important thing is to be courageous in the conversation. How can I better help the individual understand my point of view, but also to be willing to walk away from the negotiation. What are the alternatives that I have? Now, I don't believe in getting people uh, uh, ultimatums. I jokingly say, if you give somebody the ultimatum, you'll get ketchup. (laughs) If I do negotiate, if I do negotiate, Perry, and I'm going to say, if this doesn't happen, then this, I have to be willing to take the alternative. Mm -hmm. So it's, what's that first no? How can I push back or push or push forward with what it is I'm looking for and what do I really want out of this negotiation Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be an absolute I might be trying to move a person closer to my position or in a different direction but everything doesn't have to be you absolutely lose and I absolutely win sometimes I've found in key negotiations that we come to the middle whether it's negotiating pricing with a client whether it is talking about increased salary which I've had to do several times in my career I'll still tell you a story about negotiating. Early on in my career, um, I had trained a, a male who had come into the business. That was when I was in another firm, and we were working in the Treasury Department. I had trained him, and end of the year came, and we were having our evaluations, and a male manager said to me, our mutual male manager said, well, I'm going to give him a little more this year, Connie, and I want you to understand that because his wife is expecting twins. <gasps> wow. Wow. Now, that was <laughs> bad. Back in the eighties, <laughs> it's because his wife is expecting twins. Now I'm I'm married and child free, and that's all by choice. And I, and I sat there stunned. I said, "But I trained this person, and you're telling me that because he's expanding his family by choice, that he is worth more to the organization than I am." I just need you to understand. Well, of course, I didn't understand, but I also knew it would probably be pointless to negotiate with him. This was a risk that I took in negotiating. At that point in time, the individual who was the treasurer was one of my mentors. And I talked to him about it. And he suggested to me, you go back and have a conversation about the value that you bring to the organization. He said, and then you're going to come back and talk to me. And I'm going to give you the air cover, though, to say, here is what I need and here is what I deserve without threat, but just to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I went back and had that conversation. Now, I know that I had a, 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 a mentor out there who was going to support me. But the individual did take that argument because there was just no basis There was just no basis, and quite frankly, it was discriminatory. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, thank you for sharing that because it's it's still happening, right? People don't even Mm -hmm. recognize sometimes when they're – because I'm willing to bet that that man thought 
that he was actually doing something very human, very nice, very kind, thinking about that person and their expanded family, whatever. They don't even recognize the implications of decisions that they make like that or comments that they make like that. Um, and so I, I think it's really, really important that we all recognize that we should understand what we're worth and we should fight right. for what we're worth because even if you let it go, then you don't just do a disservice to yourself, you do a disservice to every other woman who is trying to fight for her worth because they and just it, you let that perpetuate. And you make such an excellent point. This was not an evil, awful man. Right. Exactly. He was actually quite a very competent, very nice, very caring. In fact, he rated me higher than the guy that he was giving more money to. But, right. But I'm smart so enough to know. Right. It, it, it was inc I was incredulous and way younger than I am now in my career. So this was a huge risk for me. But it was, I thought, so he thought that I'd go off with the, the top rating and be happy when this guy was going to be making probably 10 to 15% more than me. You see how that works? So he really did not think he was doing anything that was wrong. Yeah, exactly. Exa and that's why I say it matters that we all speak exactly. up because exactly. otherwise it just keeps going. Exactly. So I want to talk a little bit more about transitions. Um, even really confident and capable women can feel nervous or unsettled when they have to make a big transition. And I'm really thinking about a lot of our listeners, a lot of the women I talk to now, are they're looking at second acts. They have been very successful or they've gotten to a certain point and they just want to change. They either want or they need a change. Um, and, and these people, even though they have accomplished a lot and they're very capable, I'm, I'm really, and myself, when I stepped down from craft, I did it intentionally. I had a year to plan for it. And I got to tell you, I stepped down and I thought, oh my God, what have I done? And it took me about a year to get my sea legs again because I was so used to living a certain way. And so what advice, if you've ever had to make a big transition and felt kind of unsettled about it or nervous, what advice would you have for, for women who are, who are facing that situation? How do you get your confidence back? How do you ensure that you come out the other side? First, I'd say that your transition was brilliant. Whatever you were experiencing, cognitive dissonance internally, it in no way showed in the way that you worked with all of us. And you were a role model to many of us. I think the first thing, I've transitioned. So I transitioned from telecommunications to finance mid-career. And it was thinking about, and I had come from college, had gone into the role that I was in and, and spent 14 years in telecommunications before transitioning to banking. Now, some might wonder what it is about regulated entities and me. I don't know. It's karma. Uh, I've adjusted to it after all these years. But it was, I had not even had to apply for a job in 14 years, had mm -hmm. had a great career in telecommunications. But it was, the first thing was relationships. Mm -hmm. relationships. What kind of broad relationships that I developed internally and externally? What was my external brand? If I wanted to make a move in order to advance my career, how would I do that? I had developed relationships at Northern Trust while I was at Ameritech, having worked with them as a client. Mm -hmm. So there were people inside the organization who knew of my work and who knew of me. When I was invited to interview for a role there, that was very helpful. So it was making the decision to leave a career where I had stalled out at a company that my mentor and my, my sponsor had left, it was time to move forward. So building good, strong relationships where people are willing to recommend you. The second thing I'd say is I often ask young people, for what do you want to be known? What is that unique skill or set of skills or capabilities for which you are known? That if someone is talking about you to others, they can clearly articulate your value proposition. And for me, it was strategic thinking, it was inspirational leadership, it was financial acumen, and it was inclusive behaviors as a leader. Those were the things that I became known for, and today I can still articulate those things and live them out. And then the third thing was just do it. To yeah. borrow from Nike, mm -hmm. you just have to do it. Because the more we think about it, Perry, you know this, we get stuck in all the things that could happen, and we wind up being in the same place. All those things could happen. Usually they don't. Mm -hmm. We don't wind up, you know, in bad financial situations because we're wise as we go through that. And, and, and one final thing was, you know, I have a wonderful board of directors, and these are women and men. There's five of them in my life who are willing to have candid feedback for me. They love and care about me, but they are also not afraid of me. They will <laughs> challenge my thinking. <laughs> they will challenge my thinking. They will 
help me see things in a different way. And with those individuals, I can be transparent enough to say, you know, this scares me a little bit. This has me concerned. Help me walk through the scenario or the way that I need to look at this. And those five people are the top five people that I can go to for advice, for counsel, or just a hug. Some days, you know, you just need a hug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So true. That, that is awesome. Um, so I have uh, another question for you, which is you've achieved so much. You've been at the top for literally decades at this point. What is it that keeps you motivated at this point? I know you don't need the money and I know you don't need the power and the fame and whatever. All that can be nice. But what is it that actually gets you out of bed every morning and makes you want to go into the office? Number one is I listened to my, my grandmother, my, my father's mother, who would always say to us when we were young people growing up in Milwaukee, who in underserved communities, we were not wealthy. I didn't come from a family of individuals who had lots of money or lots of college education, but just solid, amazing, wonderful people. My mother was my role model, God rest her soul. And what keeps me going is her saying, cover all the ground you stand on. Mm. She said, cover all the ground you stand on. It does not matter what your economic standing is. Your zip code does not determine your destiny. Your, you know, knowing your net worth is not the same as knowing your self-worth, Connie. Mm-hmm. But if you're covering all the ground you stand on, you're making room for other people and other people watching you navigate life to say, I can do that too. So for me, Perry, what gets me up every morning is God gave me breath that he must have something for me to do. How can I be of use? How can I be of use so that until my last breath, I'm able to say, I showed up, I tried to make a positive difference in the world, and I used life up. Life did not use me up. Oh, wow. Okay, I've got, I've got goosebumps. But it's, God, see, I knew you were going to be so inspirational. Every time I talk to you, I just love it. And, it's, and the thing is, it is true about you. Your mama was very bright. You do live every moment. I have, I have seen it, and, uh, and I think that's great. So, so God bless you. you. I think that's awesome. So looking back, Every single woman I know has had to overcome, and this is not even just women of color, and I know you probably have had some additional um, hardships and challenges, but every woman I know has had to overcome some bad breaks, big failures, or frankly been on the receiving end of some totally unacceptable behavior. Clearly, it didn't stop you on your rise to the top. So would you be willing to share kind of one of the most difficult or outrageous things that happened to you, and, and how did you handle it? In addition to, obviously, the guy who said that the twins were really more important. <laughs> <laughs> than my economic viability, exactly. absolutely. I wish I could tell you that there, there weren't that many. But even today, there are still things that, that happen. I'm wise enough to identify them. I have enough personal power and confidence to address it in a way that's respectful, but, but ensuring that it certainly never happens again. There are a couple that I'd like to share. One early on in my career, when I first started my career, I had a manager who said to me, you know, you're only here because of affirmative action. People, people who look like you don't belong here, but since the law says you have to be, let's see what you can do. <gasps> Thank you. Wow, that's supportive. There you go. There you go. So how did I respond to that? I, first of all, being stunned, I was 21 years old, my first job out of college, obviously nowhere near the confidence that I have today. But I allowed that to spur me on to say, I really am going to show how competent I am because I carried the burden of every black person who would come into this company after me or who were already there trying to move forward. So, so to carry the burden, but then to rise above that and say, wait a second, this is his limited view of who I am. That is not what my family taught me about who I am. So how do I continue to operate in excellence, but also to, to share the kind of lessons that I've learned? Fast forward to today, when I was running the sales group, oftentimes I'd come in with one of the salespeople and they would assume that I was the salesperson and the guy was the person in charge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, a, a client or whomever. And so how did I learn to assert myself? And not in any way that was emotional or anything like that. Oftentimes I'd let it play out where they turn to the guy, shake his <laughs> hand, welcome him, <laughs> ask questions, and so on. I'd step up and say, hi, my name is Connie Lindsay, so on and so forth. And I lead the sales team and this person and I are happy to talk with you today. So it's pulling it back to the conversation. Not in any way that I didn't have to be loud or inappropriate. It was just to come, to have your conversation, believe that, this, and they usually were male, who are in charge, but to come forward to say, 
you know, I'm going to own this space. Remember, Grandma's voice is resonating mm-hmm. inside of me saying, mm-hmm. cover all the ground you stand on. Mm-hmm. And for women, I think it's important, own your power. You have the title. If I ask you what you do for a living, don't say, I'm just A. I'm just a sales manager. You are not. I lead the sales team that generates XYZ in revenue. I've developed several processes that's increased our competency and our efficacy in dealing value to our clients. Have that statement. You are not just anything. You are absolutely where you're supposed to be. You've earned the right to be there, so cover all the ground you stand on. That is great. Great advice. So I have a couple fun questions now. Um, you, you actually mentioned this. So what is the one word you would use to describe your professional path so far and why? My professional path so far and why? I would say resilient. Okay. It's a good one. And resiliency to me is so important because as you said in one of the earlier questions or as you asked in one of the earlier questions, every day is not walking on sunshine. If we're not having some level of failure or conflict, then we are not making the kinds of changes and doing the things that we ought to be doing. As a leader, if everyone is happy and delighted with me, then clearly I'm not creating enough disruption in the way that we're doing things to have us all a little bit uncomfortable and ever more competitive. (laughs) So I'd say resilient. Things happen in life, both personally and professionally. Um, I'll share this. In 2008, my, who was then my boyfriend, who's now my husband, um, had we had been dating for oh since ninety one actually, and he was diagnosed with um, incurable blood cancer in two thousand five. In two thousand eight, he was diagnosed with another cancer, and my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I work in financial services, and what happened to the market in two thousand eight? It crashed. Ah, ah, so, so gosh. if there was ever a need for resilience, Perry, yeah. that was the time that I needed it. It was navigating both my professional life and my personal life. But I'm real clear about priorities. And for me, my priorities are clearly God, family, and work. And if you follow me around on any given day, you'll see that that is, I begin my day with prayer and meditation. I end my day with prayer and meditation. My family has access to me as needed and when needed. And I love what I do. I call my work at this point in my career that I connect my soul to my role. And that's a blessing. Not everyone gets the opportunity to do that. I do. So I believe that I can do more, be more, and serve more. But at that moment of resilience, how was I able to have the systems that I needed in my life? What was I willing to not do in order to be present for my husband during his treatment or making sure that I spent the quality time with my mom who lived in another state to do those kinds of things? And fortunately, I work for a wonderful company. And oftentimes when we talk about these kinds of things for women at your level and mine, we do have resources. It was not a resource issue. But what we don't have, that's not different from any other woman, is the capacity to just continue to to work through it, Mm -hmm. to deal with the psychological and emotional work. So resilience for me is key. It's it's walking through it. It's saying, what can this teach me about myself and my life? And then how can I use those lessons in order to be a blessing to someone else? Mm. Yeah, I I would have to say that's just, that is a really tough, any one of those would have derailed many people, uh, male or female. And so I think you're right. And I think that you, you know, clearly you have the strength and you have support and you, and you made it through. And so I think that's a, that was a, a great example to share with people. So when they're feeling down, it definitely made me feel really wimpy when something I was thinking about. I'm just, I'm just sitting there going, I got you know nothing what? to complain about. Nothing at all. And it's all. fascinating. And what I love though, Perry, is the more we talk to people, you've heard this saying, interested people are interesting people. And even my story being what it was and what it continues to be today, man, there are people who are still having it worse than that. Because imagine having all of that confluence of events, but having no financial resources to walk through that. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. I read the news every day. I watch the news every day. And I'm just horrified. And it just makes me think, whatever I am facing. Is, it may be very hard for me, but it is nothing compared to, I'm still one of the 1% of blessed, uh, and it's not just finances, but that's clearly part of it. Um, so I, Now, there weren't, I, days when I, there weren't days when I just, you know, didn't just lay on the floor. And as Mother <laughs> Teresa said, you know, Lord, I know you won't give me more than I can bear, but I wish you didn't trust me so much. <laughs> <laughs> So right. all, I think you overestimated those. my skills. <laughs> exactly. That was the conversation. So it doesn't mean that I didn't allow myself those moments, Perry, to say, wow, two people that I love the most in the world are going through the most difficult things that anyone could ever imagine. The thought that my mother would lose her memory and not know who I was at some point in time was absolutely devastating. 
But what I was able to do was to be present with her, in the, to care for her, to do the kinds of things that she had done for me. I mean, there's nothing like giving your mom a bath or helping her to eat. That is the ultimate role reversal. But for me, it's also the kind of thing that taught me and confirms what servant leadership looks like. Mm -hmm. To love her like that meant that when she went home to be with the Lord, I had no guilt. My tears were tears of not being able to call her every night at 7 o'clock like I've done since I left Milwaukee and moved to Chicago. But the joy that I had, that her journey was done, her suffering was to be no more, and the memories that I have, they just made me stronger. And now I have her with me every day, her voice in my, in my mind to encourage me, to inspire me, and just the love that has allowed me to shower that on others who are in need. That is amazing. Don't make me cry. Um, so I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm going to go to a more fun question because it's, it's getting very emotional on my side. So if you could have <laughs> a superpower roundtable with three women, alive or past, wow. who wow. would they be and why? Maya Angelou would be one of them oh, because okay. she had such a way with words that she could paint a picture to make you feel an emotion, to smell a scent, or just to be still. She was such an open person and an inclusive person, and I had the privilege of meeting her, uh, being in her home and having a conversation with her, and that is who she was to the very core of her being. So I would just love to have her there as a conversation. The second would be Mother Teresa, because how could someone who was so humble, who wanted nothing for herself, who really worked with the least of these, but believed that they were as important as anyone else without anything that she wanted for herself would just be amazing to meet her. And the third is another woman whom I admire, who's still alive, and another uh, with whom I have met and had conversations, and that's our First Lady, Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a wonderful, fun conversation, and I want a really good Cabernet to go with it. <laughs> yes, and actually, I, I want to come too. That sounds like an amazing, <laughs> You're invited. amazing meal. Um, You're invited. So here, we're, we're, we're running out of time, so I just want to get to the last word, and it can be a combination of words. Don't think it has to be just one, but... It's either the single most important thing or a couple things that you would tell other women who are seeking to build the careers and lives of their dreams or the best piece of career advice you ever got. The first thing I'd say, Perry, is seek self-mastery. Mm -hmm. We don't know the depth of our capabilities, abilities, the, the power that we have inside of us until we have self-mastery. When you have self-mastery, you're not persuaded or moved or dissuaded by the opinions, the thoughts, and the ideas of others. You are confident enough that you are definitely, as I said before, covering all the ground you stand on, but you know your impact, influence, and engagement in the world. Self-mastery. Seek first to know yourself. The second one is to define success for yourself. You know, as we would tell our Girl Scouts, there's all kinds of leadership. It, does, it doesn't always have to be positional leadership. So define success so that when others are saying, by this time you ought to be making X amount of money or have this title, that might not be success for you. And once you have self-mastery, you become so comfortable saying, as you did, I'm going to take my life and career in a different direction. Others may have an opinion, but it matters not because I'm clear about what I hear life and the universe calling me to do. And when we show up in that way, that's when the magic happens. That is when we get to see lives transformed and the vibration and what we bring really draws people to us. That to me is the pure joy of a life that's living on purpose, drawing power to it, and proclaiming that I'm here for a reason because God made me and he doesn't make junk. Well, I, I cannot think of a better place to end. Uh, Connie, thank you so much. As I predicted, incredibly both valuable, insightful, and inspirational. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for including me, Perry. You've been listening to Pivot Points, a series designed to help ambitious women have the careers and lives of their dreams. To hear more interviews, go to www.yourcareeryourterms.com. And be sure to tell us what you think. If there are topics you'd like covered or people you'd like interviewed, 